I always say to, especially for for the young ones coming through, to not give up, to always believe in what they're doing and to always practice to improve. There, there's no such thing as perfect. I don't believe in anything as, as something can be so perfect. bad injury when I was 18 just before I was about to make my debut on Tuesday against Arsenal in the Carling Cup. Training came 11 o'clock we're doing like little five-a-side game at the end. First player comes in I give him Cruyff chop him then the second player comes in I chop him then the third player comes scissored me like knee high I ended up being out for 10 months. When you joined Blues, it was under Gary Rowett. So what was your relationship kind of like with him at the time? Not good. Really? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to the Blues Focus podcast. Tonight we are delighted to be joined by former Blues winger who wore the number 19 shirt in his five-year spell down at St Andrews, Jack Magoma. How are you doing this evening, mate? I'm good, mate. My pleasure. Wicked, yeah, it's awesome to hear. Uh, so yeah, let's just get straight into it. So we're very much looking forward to this. Thank you, Jax, for coming on. Um, I would just like to sort of start this um podcast with a couple of quick fire questions. Um, one of them sort of kicking it off. What was your earliest football memory? Something that really sticks out in your mind. My earliest football memory. Um, I'll probably say it's probably the worst one where. I was, I was 12, I, I was on trial at um, Tottenham Hotspur. Um, I got a two-week trial. And after the two weeks, you know, being told that I wasn't good enough um, by the manager, that ended up signing me again, by the way. But yeah, I think though that's probably the earliest one that I could, that really sticks out um, is being told by, you know, by a coach or uh, that I wasn't good enough and I literally wasn't going to get signed at 12 years old. Yeah. That's dampen the mood that has Jax. Dampen the mood. <laughs> listen, listen, there is it it does um it does become the story does go better to be honest yeah. because at the same the same the same coach who told me I wasn't good enough at 15 ended up signing me for wow. Tottenham. Yeah, man. So yeah. So I, I, I always say to, especially for for the young ones um, coming through, um, like I said, I'm into coaching now, so I coach quite a lot of the young lads. Um, I, I've been back at Tottenham and it's great to be back there um, again, uh, giving just my my knowledge, my experiences and, and handing it down to the younger lot, to the new generation, I would say. And I always try to tell them like one person, one, one coach's opinion is not, the end of the world. Do you know what I mean? Everyone's got different opinions. I might not think that you're good enough, but someone else might say, you know, brilliant, I'll take you on. Um, so I always tell, you know, young players to not give up, to not to always believe in what they're doing, um, and to always practice to improve. Um, there, there's no such thing as perfect. I don't believe in anything as, as something can be so perfect. I always believe that practice makes it, uh, practice makes improvement, uh, not perfect, uh, not perfection. So, yeah, so that that's that's what I try to 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 teach young kids now because I had to go, go through that stage where, like I said, not not be not being told that I wasn't good enough, and at the end of the, and after that, after like two years, three years, going back on trial and you know getting signed by the same coach was, you know, it just tells the whole story by itself. That's yeah, kids up on, yeah. That's sick. That's sick. Um, do you want me to go, Tommy? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm um, so just curious. Who did you support when you were younger? You yeah, support. Uh, I supported Spurs. Um, oh, I lived okay. so so when I so when I first came into the country, I, I lived literally. I'll probably say five minutes from from White Hart Lane, the, the old White Hart Lane. Yeah. Um, so, you know, growing up, you know, watching people going to the stadium, watching people, you know, singing and coming out when, you know, when, when Tottenham's won, uh, when, when a goal, um, when we scored and when Spurs scored, I could hear the noise. Oh, so wow. I, I grew up supporting Tottenham, hence why, like I was so, I was so determined to, you know, to wanting to play for, you know, for, for the club that I supported for, you know, as a boy, boyhood club growing up. And and you and you're blues through and through now, Jax, yeah? 
Yeah, I'm blues for free. No, like you know, yeah, Spurs, yeah. Spurs are doing my head in a little bit with their performance. <laughs> uh, I'll was, I was, I was, I was, I was yeah. stick with Birmingham for now. Yeah. <laughs> um, in terms of in terms of a favorite player growing up, who, who was your favorite? Wow. Um, I, I had a couple, but growing up, I think I I watched a lot of Ronaldinho, a lot of Zidane. Um. I think the internet was relatively new, like when I, I'm not as, you know, I'm a bit older than you guys. You guys are quite blessed to have that. But um, yeah, I, I think um, there, there's, there, I used to watch countless amount of hours on on, on, on clips on, of Zidane and, and Ronaldinho, especially. I think those two were, were my favourite ones. Like I said on my Twitter today, like I remember watching the World Cup, World Cup 98 Brazil v France final and it's it's just like yeah that that's like me watching that just takes me back to watching like with like my favorite players all on the same pitch um at the same time it was unbelievable yeah so I'll probably say um I'll probably say Ronaldinho uh, Zidane and also R9 did you oh, yeah. did you try to base your your game off those two were you trying to replicate what you did on the pitch because of what they did yeah, I, I was never good. I was never as good as them, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, I think I think I aspired. I aspired to be to be like them. I aspired to have that technical um, ability to beat players. Um, I think that's where I got it from. Like just from watching them and going out and practicing on my own. And I would literally, I remember just taking cones um, outside my, you know, the the, the state where I lived um, when I was younger, and just getting cones out, out on the grass and and dribbling in and out um, using the no ball sign and try to hit it like like I'm practicing free kicks. I remember all of that like it was yesterday. Do you know what I mean? So. That those are the things that I remember growing up in in terms of like trying to improve my game, trying to mimic the best players at the you know doing that at the best clubs, um, at world class level. So growing up, that's I think every player should have someone they they aspire like you know do you know what I mean they look up to and um, who's a good example as well. And for me, it was it was Ronaldinho, Zidane, and um, also R nine. Like I said. Unreal set of players, aren't they? Absolutely unreal. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, Jamie, did were you? Did you catch any of of those two, Dino and um, Zidane? Uh, yeah, but obviously I'm 28, going on 29, so they're relatively like I was a bit younger at the time, especially the 98 World Cup. I was five, six, so mm-hmm. it's there in my memory bank, but it's not too. Yeah. It's a bit vague, if you know what I mean. I think yeah. we we missed out Tommy there, didn't we? Uh, you missed prime prime yeah. era football. That was yeah. Like, oh, <laughs> if oh, only, man. if my only. earliest memory, I think, is the two thousand and two World Cup final. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, that was a that was actually a good that was a, that was that was also a good year to be honest. Yeah, some people, yeah. France Italy was it? The Zidane headbutt. No, that's two thousand six. <laughs> no, that's that's 06. 06. Yeah, yeah, that's that was, yeah. That's the uh, it, 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 Brazil won in 2006, didn't they? Did Brazil win in 2006? No, no, 2002, they did, yeah. Yeah, 02 Brazil won, sorry, yeah, they did. Brazil won 2002, okay. And then mm-hmm. Italy won in 2006. Oh, yeah, I think I remember going to primary school and having to watch David Seaman get lobbed from 45 yards, actually. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's there. Oh, yeah, the pain is there still, <laughs> never leaves. Well, um, speaking of um, terrible football moments, yeah, uh, have, we're going on the opposite there. Have you yeah. got any favourite football moments, which is your best that stands out? Favourite football moments. Um, my favourite one, like I said, 15, signing for Tottenham. Um, I was 17, signing my first professional contract at Spurs. Um, and then making my making my debut really um, professionally at, at Burton Albion. I was 21 when I made my full-on professional debut uh, in, in like, for, like senior senior game, I'd say. Um um, I don't count like the twenty threes or eighteens as, as any game. So like, I, um, so I'll, I'll probably say twenty one. So I'll probably say those three. I think those three for me stick up the most because when I was young, that's all I I dreamt of doing is playing football, and you know, sign those are like those are like moments in my life that would would always stick with me. Like me signing that dot on the dotted line at Tottenham. Um, after working so hard, like I said, like I work, I, I literally, I used to train pretty much every single day 
um, maybe bar bar Sunday um, on my own because every like, like I said, I, I I tell I tell young players this as well. I say like if you want to go to an academy, just think about the amount of hours these these players are playing. So these these players are playing and these players are training. So they start from the age of six, seven, and they train three times a week and they play on a Sunday. So that's four, that's four times. And if you want to go to these academies, you gotta to have to do double that. Yeah. You're yeah. gonna to have to do double that to to then match what they're doing because they're way ahead of you already. So that's exactly what I did when I didn't get signed. I, I went to Tottenham. I was unprepared. I wasn't trained as much. Yes, I was good, but I wasn't better than what they have. So they, they're not going to sign me if I'm not better than what they have. So I tried to tell you, don't be, don't go um, to a, an academy or to a club expecting to be this at the same level as those players and expect it to be signed. You have to be, you have to be way better. Mm. Um, so me in, in, so me doing that, end up me getting like I said signing my professional contract um and then you know like I said I ended up leaving at 21 and and signing for Burton and that first game you know I think that's that's everything to me because the rest of that is just it's just history I ended up moving on to Sheffield Wednesday and then you know Birmingham for five years you know but that's the the platform that gave me to be in a position to play for Birmingham for five years was all those years of training and hard work. Mm. Um, yeah. how, so how did that how did that move to, to Burton come about? Was it was it working at Spurs or was that more your decision or the club's decision? How did that how did that come about? Yeah, it was a bit of both to be fair. Like it was it, Harry Redknapp signed. So so under Martin Yo, I was involved with the first team. You know, I I got a really bad injury um when I was seven when I was 18. Um, I was 17, 18 at the time. I got a really bad injury um, just before I was about to make my debut. Like Martin Yo pulled me in his office and he was like, listen, Jack, you're going to play on Tuesday against Arsenal in the Carling Cup. Um, this was on a Thursday. He goes, first team's got a game on on um, on Saturday. Uh, we need to win. It's a Premier League game. We need to win. So I'm not going to, I'm going to rest them. Um, and then we, uh, we, I'm gonna play, you know, some some young players on Tuesday. I was like, no problem. I was buzzing, so he pulled me in office. I was like, oh, I'm buzzing, Gaffer. Listen, I won't let you down. You know, I'm gonna do my best. I'm gonna work hard. And he, he literally turned around to me and goes, All right, get out now. Like I was sitting in his office. He was like, All right, get out now. Like I've told you, I need to tell you to get out. But he was old school, so I ended up leaving. You know, I rang my dad. I was buzzing, and you know, he's like, Yeah, cool. Then on the Friday came into training, you know, I got, um, I went and told the 18s manager because I was supposed to travel with Coventry um, away to play in the under 18s game. And um, yeah, like he said, no problem, go train with the 23s if you don't want to play because you don't want to get injured. I was like, yeah, I don't want to play. Cause I, I didn't say I don't want to play. I was just like, he, he understood, like obviously me playing, making my debut, I didn't want to risk going to Coventry and not playing. So I explained that to him. It was um, Alex Ingleform, who's now the uh, Liverpool Academy manager. Okay. And yeah, and and he, you know, he he told me no problem, Jack. Go speak to Clive, who is the twenty threes manager. So when I spoke to Clive, Clive said perfectly fine. Training came eleven o'clock. Went out, trained. Last kick of the game. We're doing like little um, uh, five a side game at the end. Last kick. Clive Allen shouts, last goal wins. So I get the ball. First first player comes in. I give him a Cruyff, chop him. Then the second player comes in. I chop him. Then the third player comes and literally. Um, a lad called Dorian De Vee. Um, he literally just scissored me like knee height, bang! I like, just took my knee out. Um, I ended up being out for ten months oh, um, after God. that. Yeah, and literally, I ended up missing my debut. And and in football, you know, if you miss the train, that's it. Like there's other players that come through. I mean, I I, I was unlucky at the time because I, it was like Jamie O'Hara, um, Aaron Lennon, Tom Huddleston. Um, Danny Rose, Jake Livermore, Ryan Mason, Andros Townsend, all these players were coming behind me. Mm. And or some of them, and you had I'll you have someone like Gareth Bale who's in there, he's the same age, like he's 87, Aaron Lennon, 86, like all these players who literally ended up getting the chance. And I was injured for about 10 months. But it took me 
another 10 months just for me to recover. So I was pretty much out almost for two years. Um, so when I came back, like I said, I ended up missing you. You miss the train, like your your opportunity goes, you know. Then then the manager gets sacked. Harry Redknapp came in, and you know I spoke to him, and he said, "Listen, I'll send you out on loan because I don't, I haven't seen you play. I'm focusing on the first team." He sent me out on loan. Um, he sent me out on loan to Bournemouth, and you know Bournemouth wanted to sign me, but they had no chairman, they had no money. And I said, no, like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to sign here. Like, you know, I'm not, I can't play for free. Like, do you know what I mean? Mm. And I ended up signing for Burton and then Bournemouth got double promotion. <laughs> oh, what are the chances? <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? So it was, it was a de- decision that I had to make is either I stay at Spurs and rot in, within the 23s, you know, and stay in the under 23s and, and, keep saying, oh, I play for Tottenham, I play for Tottenham, but not really going anywhere in my career. It was a tough decision because I I love I love Spurs. Um and you know I but I had to let go because I, I had to go and play. I had to make I had to go and make a name for myself. I had to go and fend for myself and I had to build my career. Um mm-hmm. so it was, a, it was a tough decision but it's a decision that I wouldn't regret because I've then been able to you know to to play for um, very good clubs. Um, you know, I went I went to Burton and spent four years there. You know, I spent two years at Sheffield Wednesday and then five years at Birmingham City. Um, I don't think I would have got to that stage if I stayed at Tottenham, um, you know, if I didn't make that decision to, to go and explore, you know, what the world can offer me mm. at 21. Yeah, yeah. Well, obviously, when you joined Blues, it was under Gary Rowett. Um, so what was your relationship kind of like with him at the time? Not good. Really? <laughs> oh, wow. That's yeah, amazing. no, no, no. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why. Because so Gary, so Gary was at Burton, right? Mm-hmm. So I signed um, for uh, Paul Pisca Salido um, at, at Burton. He signed me and Gary Wilde was the assistant. And I was coming from, I was coming from Spurs. I was a little bit on like, on the brink of like, I, I kind of did what I want at, like, at the time. Like I was young, like I did, I wasn't, I wasn't, I didn't really listen to, to, to many people. Um, and, you know, I, I had a little bit of an, of an attitude, even Spurs had a little bit of an attitude and it, it also, it, it wasn't good. I'm not saying that it's, it's a good thing. It, it also was almost like, I felt a lot of, of disappointment not having played at Tottenham. So like I kind of carried a little bit of that, like a little bit of anger with me when I left. Um, And then, you know, I went to Burton, Gary was the assistant and me and him didn't get on. Like we literally didn't get on. Like there's certain, there's, there's a few times where, you know, like he, like my, my work rate was never as it was at Birmingham. Like I, I always thought, you know, as a winger, I was just like, listen, just give me the ball and I'll take on players and I'll go and assist or I'll go score. That's what I thought football like at the time. It's not what I thought football was, but when I watched the top players, like the, you know, the higher you go, I think the less work you probably may have to do in those in those areas, mm-hmm. especially playing out wide. Um, you're more so criticised if you don't score and assist. But I think the lower down you go, I think work rate comes into it. And I think that's where me and him clashed. Um, and then, you know, he, he then took over. Um, we had a chat, many chats, some good, some bad. Um, so there's some disciplinary actions, some, some were good, you know. And then, you know, we sat down, you know, we worked out our differences. And then, we, like, he really became like, like a mentor to me. Um, you know, I, I, I got... To, to a, to an age I was like 23 24 and you know I kind of I was starting to get like to to mature a little bit more I was starting to understand things a lot more um life became a lot more clearer to me like what I wanted to do where I wanted to go and we sat down and we spoke about these things and um, not only that I think he really helped me like with even with things like my in my personal life you know with family and you know with kids and whatnot and yeah, we kept we kept in good co- in in good contact. Um, I ended up scoring that that season. I ended up scoring eighteen goals, fourteen assists. Um, I got in the team of the year, player of the season, and whatnot. 
and then got my move to Sheffield Wednesday. And, you know, I kept in contact with him, ended up playing Birmingham um, in my last year, spoke to him after the game. And the conversation was literally brief. Is that what you're doing this summer? I was, I was like, well, I'm out of contract. Like, I'm going to sign for Birmingham. And he, he just laughed and he's like, I'll give you a message in the summer. But it was just like a, a friend, like the, a conversation that we'd normally have. And, and yeah, and in the summer, he ended up messaging me and I messaged back. And he said, yeah, listen, do you want to sign here? And I was just like, yeah, for sure. Like, of course. Yeah. Yeah, and like it, it was easy as that. He wasn't like, oh, I'm gonna speak to your agent and whatnot. He, like it was just conversation between us two. Um, and you know, my my dad's always re- represented me like throughout my career anyway. So mm. I'll just say like, Dad, like, like I'm gonna sign up Birmingham. Like Gary's message me. He's just like, yeah, okay, cool. Um, so yeah, that that's how it went. It was easy as that. The reason why as well is because Damari Gray was supposed to go to Leicester that season, wasn't he? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I was, I, I was, I was supposed to come in and almost be like a backup or replacement if he goes. He ended up not going. That's why you know for the first I'll say three four months of the season, I didn't play until he left to go um, to Leicester in January, mm-hmm. and then I started playing more regularly. Um, but yeah, so like I was, I, I was supposed to come in to kind of mm-hmm. be, you know, um, a backup to that. But you know, he ended up working working out well, and you know, he he's one my he's one of my favorite manager, if not my favorite. Mm. Um, it's him, um, Paul Piscasolido and Gary Monk. I'll probably put in the top three, but I'll definitely put Gary as number one because throughout my career, he's helped me so much. Um, mm. and you know, I still keep in contact with him now, so which is, um, which is mm. good. So mm. were you quite surprised? Because us as Blues fans at the time, when Browett was sacked. I mean, I think it was after the Ipswich game, I want to say. We were, what, mm-hmm. seventh in the league? Something like that. Zach, so, stop talking. Stop talking. I, but, sad. I know, I'm so I know, I know, I know. I'm still fuming. But, but were, were you surprised? Because I was, I was calling up my dad and I was like, wow, it's been sad. What, what's going on? Was it su- surprising for you as a player? Yeah, we 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 thought it was banter at first. Like we thought it was just like because yeah. he, he's he, like sometimes he'll pull banter and whatnot. Like we just thought, oh, come on, like stop messing about. Like literally in the canteen, um, having having dinner and come like you're just like yeah, um, lads, that's it. You know, I'm not gonna be here. Um, I'm going. I'm gone. It was like so everyone like eating. They just like looking at him. It was like what, what are you talking about, man? Like stop messing about. Like we were flying. Like we were having a very, very good, like we had a good start to the season. Team spirit was good. You know, the fans were like buzzing. Um, the 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 city was was you know was buzzing, and we were just like, uh, we couldn't believe what was going on. We we had no clue that it was going to happen. We had there was no reason for it to happen, and you know I think it was a mistake that the club definitely definitely regrets because I think. If he if he had stayed, I think we would have definitely been, you know, in the playoffs. Mm. Like hundred percent, we'd definitely been in the playoffs because we had we had a good squad. Like the team, everything was just going well um, in the team. And if he had stayed, uh, I can I can only think that you know we definitely would have done really well. Mm. Yeah, I just. It was absolutely heartbreaking at the time for me. I just remember coming back from school and just seeing that Gary Rowett's been sacked on Sky. I just thought, what the hell yeah. has gone on there? That's insane. Um, mm. But hopefully, and fingers crossed, things will get better soon. Um, but in terms of like how at the Blues, um, mm-hmm. obviously you've played under quite a lot of managers, particularly in that time when after Rowett was sacked. Um, so you say that Rowett's probably your favourite manager. Um, but is there any like favorite teammates in the Blues team that there was like particular people in there? Yeah, of course. Like you, you bond, you bond with um, with certain people more than you do with others. But I, I was always one. Like I got on with everyone. Like I never, like I never not got on with like, every teammate of mine. I, I don't think I've ever not got on with any of them. Mm. Um, but I think we we I had we had like a a group. Like especially, I think the first person I probably knew in the in the dressing room was was David Davis um, Digger, mm. um, and then we kind of formed a, a friendship um, between him, um, Shay, um, Harley, um, Isaac Vassell, um, Clayton Donaldson was another one. Um, 
Um, who else was in there? Uh, Juki, Max, something yeah, like. So we had, we had, we had relatively a, a good, a good friendship. I, 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 I got on. Like I said, I got on well with everyone. Um, but I'd say probably I, I'd say um, Harley, uh, Digger, um, Shay, um, Vass. Um, when when um, Omar Bogle came, um, he like me and him got on like really well. Wes Harden was another young one that you know that that I got on really well with. Um, Clayton Donaldson, um, yeah, like, I think those ones in particular. Even uh, Jonathan Grounds, Paul Robinson was probably one that um, I had lots of chats with. Um, he he like. He's such a good guy. Michael Morrison, um, first captain. He was another one. Um, got on really well with. Um, even Keith. I mean, Keith, uh, Keith Dumbell, Like he, he was a legend. Like he, he yeah. was just, yeah. He's he was another one. He was mm. good. Um, Josh McEachern. Me and him, yeah. literally. Yeah. yeah. Like Josh was. Josh is probably one of the funniest guys. Like I, I know. Like he's 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 so funny. Um. Yeah, like, like I said, I, I probably got on with I, I got on with with everyone, but I think those the the, the names I just mentioned definitely more. Yeah, I think um, oh, no, uh, um, sort of like in terms of like how you got along with the Blues players there, it just feels like there was a proper good team spirit around those sort of times, like particularly with Rowett and Monk as well, um, and obviously with a little bit of that coming back. I mean, how do you think that we're gonna do on for, uh, go on for the rest of the season? Because like, obviously the Harley Dean's come back into the team now, and um, we've looked a much better side really since he's uh, made his reappearance. Yeah, that's what I think. To be honest, um, I I think he's had his criticism. Um, I think every player goes through that. Um, he's weathered the storm, um, and he, he's come back. And for me, he just looks like a, a new player. I've always said like. Sometimes it's hard for fans to to understand maybe what a player's going through, and I don't and I don't think fans should want to understand what players going through. I think they pay their hard earned money um, to to come and watch you perform, so they shouldn't understand whether you had two hours sleep before game, whether you've had a hundred hours sleep. You know, um, I think fans don't don't they they don't really care. They just want to see you perform. Uh-huh. I think. A lot of times, um, players do struggle off the pitch. Like, expect like, but it could be personal life, whatever, whatever may be going on. Um, I think players do struggle, and I think now, just the the difference of the manager. I look at I look at the manager now, like John, like he he looks like he almost he, he reminds me a little bit of you know like Gary Rower, Gary Monk sort of um approach that he's had especially with the way the team's playing um in his in in the shape that they have like so hard to beat like i said like mm. it, it's been it's such a long time since i've watched birmingham and almost say like i don't see us losing games like yeah. We, you know, we go into games and I'm just like, okay, like I don't see us losing game. If we lose a game, it's gonna be like, I don't know, maybe team scores like the what's it called, the Sunderland game. Yeah. The second goal was really good. Like mm-hmm. the guy and he took it really early, bang, mm-hmm. finished. Um, the first goal, um, I'll question the defending because we had like chances yeah. to clear the ball. But that mm-hmm. second goal, you say, okay, you put your hand up, say, very, very good finish. Mm-hmm. But apart from that, like I, I can't see us losing many games. I can't yeah. see us being troubled by anyone because, like, defensively we just look solid. Yeah. Our midfield, um, especially when Bielik plays, is just strong. Yeah. Um, John Ruddy is literally like a, you know, he's a brick wall in there. Yeah. Um, like it's 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 gonna have to be like a unbelievable, sh- um, like goal for him to concede. Yeah. Um, it, like there's no easy so like teams are having to work really hard in terms of scoring goals like in 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 mo- in, in most of the occasions that like, teams are starting to work really hard and and previously teams didn't really have to work hard to get a goal or to go in front or to beat us it'd be it'll be from our own doing um mm-hmm. a lot of the times 
Um, so I feel like now the club is just in a good way. Like I don't know how you guys feel, but I, I feel yeah. like the club's in a very good way. Hundred percent. We've said. Oh, yeah. so, we've gone, Jamie. Oh, okay. Sorry. I was saying I agree with you hundred percent. I've said a few times now. Like I just don't see us losing, or if we do lose, it's it's a case of you know they've had to work the bollocks off for it. These <laughs> this team has had to grind this result out against us. Like even Sunderland last season, you go two and all down, you're thinking we're going to lose four or five here. We come mm-hmm. back into it denied and a very debatable penalty at the end and we just battered them for 20 minutes. Like mm. that fight is now back in this club and it just feels great. You go into games with such confidence and be useless. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. We've, we've, we've said multiple times on the podcast that I think in the past, sometimes watching blues has, has been a bit of a chore, but at the moment we're genuinely looking forward to each game. I think we, we said, uh, Oh God, a month ago, maybe that we didn't think we'd lose before the world cup break. And obviously Sunderland happened, which was, mm-hmm. you know, disappointing, but don't get me wrong. It, it wasn't a bad performance. We, we've said multiple times this season, we've probably had one or two performances where we just haven't quite been on, on it. But other than that, the performance have been, We've said, oh, this is just a good run of form, but it's getting to the stage where this just seems like a consistent team. And you're right in saying it feels like at the moment we could genuinely be anyone in this league. No one really seems... We obviously, not long ago, we played the top three, QPR, Burnley and Blackburn. And all three of those games, obviously we picked up four points. We just didn't look too troubled by them. So it's it's amazing to see. I mean, in terms of where you think we can finish this season, what are you thinking? Um, like I said, like just, just to go on um, a little bit about what you, you said there, like it's it's good to see um, that the manager's got like the basics right in terms of our, our defensive shape. You know, stopping goals from going in, conceding, and um, like you said, the the Blackburn game. I think we should have won. We had so yeah. many chances like where we could have gone. We could have gone and beat them. Yeah. I, there's no way in my house thinking how have we lost that like mm-hmm. but it wasn't like a a I don't think anyone left that game thinking oh like we were crap or like we didn't perform or whatever we actually performed really well but we just couldn't get the ball in the back of the net and it was the same thing with Burnley Burnley at home I think we could have beat them again I think we had the better chances and um, we had the more shots the more mm-hmm. clear cut chances to go and win um so my only thing, the next step would be to try and get us to dominate games more at home. So mm-hmm. I, I understand away from home, um, we might have to sit in and, and hit teams on a counter attack and, you know, and press from a mid to low block. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, try and hit teams more on, on a counter attack, play, play our more like quick players or, or like go for it maybe in the last 15, 20 minutes or whatever. I understand that away from home, but I think at home, if we want to progress and start maybe challenging the, I'll probably say the playoff spots, I think we need to start, say like a Swansea, I think Swansea came in that first half, it they really dominated possession in terms of, you know, like they were cutting us open or like they would, they would invite us to press really high, but then, you know, with the intention of okay, we're gonna get out and try and, and try and attack them, and that's my only worry moving forward is that we don't dominate or or not dominate. I'll probably say we don't impose our style of play from the start of the game. Mm. We almost play at home. We almost play the same way that we do away. If that makes sense, like sitting back waiting for teams mm. to come onto us and try. At, at, at home, I think we need to initiate the attacks. We need to initiate our style of play. We need to impose ourselves and say, okay, this is how we're going to play. We're going to set this up. We're going to go for it from minute one to 90 minutes because you're coming into our territory where we we should be able to dominate. So mm. do I think that we're do I think that the team's going to progress 100 percent I think even the manager said that it's a working it's a work in progress um so I do so I do understand it the team needs to to build over the next maybe year it might take even you know a couple of years for us to actually start challenging um these places you know and hopefully the stadium gets renovated um that as well you know the the pitch um I've always said the pitch is not great. The grass might look nice, but I guarantee mm. the, the the ground is solid. 
or even when I played, like you play like two, three games at home and your back, your joints, everything is sore because the ground yeah. is that hard, seriously. Um, oh, and man. and the fair play to the groundsmen, they always do well. They, they, always, they always do fix the pitch, but the grass might look nice, but the, it's just solid. Um, I, I, I really, end of the season, I'll, 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 I would like to say we'll finish in the top half of the table end of the season in the top half of the table I think that's a that's an unbelievable achieve, achievement for the club and also Absolutely. the manager um, and then build and then build from there you know following the, the following season I would expect us to start challenging for playoff spots mm. yeah it's so, interesting you pick up about the um, stadium and the ground as well because you're right it, 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 well obviously because you, you played on the pitch of course but it it does look like a well uh, laid turf, but it's like it's interesting to see that you picked up on something like that because it, it it's like with the stands as well because they look fine, but then beneath them you suddenly realise that there's stuff that needs to be done with it. So it's something that I think that the team now is really starting to push on. It mm-hmm. needs the people in the background now to sort of follow with them. Mm-hmm. So one hundred percent, you're you're right. Like like I said. It, Things may always seem like even when even when I was playing, I'll talk a little bit even behind the scene when I was playing. Behind the scene is something that is is crucial for a club to have. Like we, I'll just give you an example. Just look at Man United at the moment. Like from at from the top behind the scenes, everything is in turmoil, and mm-hmm. on the and you can and you, it, it comes out on the pitch. because nothing is set. And it was the same when I was playing. Like sometimes, like behind the scenes. Um, it wasn't great, um, and sometimes you, you 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 just you just can't have the consistency um, in the in your gameplay, or in, uh, the manager maybe doesn't have he doesn't pick the team like other people are doing so. So it's just like it looks now that we have everything set almost, and it kind of you, you can see that on the pitch. And like you said, if we can get the other stuff around it, in terms of the the ground even the training ground what steals I think is outdated I think we mm. need it to need the they need they need to like build it up and the reason why I say that is because I look at our neighbors you know our rivals um um Aston Villa um although it pains me to say it but they're miles ahead of us in terms of yeah. even the stadium I think the stadium is is really good it's modern um and you know the training ground is is class as well, yeah. you know. And it, it pains me to say it, but it, it, you look at Wolves as well. Like I think Wolves have have put money into it, and that's why they're doing well in the Premier League. And it started that season where you know the new owners came in. They brought a lot of players from Portugal, um, which actually elevated them, and they ended up winning the the, the championship that season. So I think everything behind the scenes has to, you know, mm. kind of follow up with what's happening on the pitch. And I think right now is a good time for for the club to start mm. pushing in that direction, maybe for the next year or two years and capitalise. Um, and actually, you know, also, it also puts a gap. Say, like, say we want to start challenging in the top 10. It puts a gap between the, the, the bottom half of the team against us. No. So if we, if we always you know, proactive instead of reactive. If we proactive and we start thinking, okay, in the next two, in the next year or the next two years, this is where we think we can be. We need to start now and, and give this manager, the current manager, all the, all the opportunity in order for him to build. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, it's just going to be like, okay, what? After yeah. a year, two years, yeah. three years, and then five years down the line, other teams mm-hmm. have probably done it and now we're trying to react yeah, exactly. in, in, instead of, you know, we could have been proactive. So I think that's the next step for Birmingham yeah. and yeah. it's good to see. I completely agree. We need that investment, don't we? I mean, I, mean, I was looking um, the other day, I think it was the we finished 17th or below from 2014, 15 or something to, to 2020. I can't quite remember fully. Um, but now the now the team's improving and progressing. We just need that investment. I mean, one of my fears, and I, I'm sure you'll agree, but a lot of those players in that current Blues team are loans. 
And my fear is, come the end of the season, we don't get that investment. Hannibal goes, Bielik goes, Longolo goes, blah, blah, blah. It, it's, it's, we need that investment to keep some of these players, improve the stadium, improve, you know, as a fan looking outside, inside, we don't fully know what's going on um, just because it's not publicised much. But in terms of like, for example, players to keep at the end of the season, do you think we could get some investment just to help out and build the squad? Because if those players do go and we're left with a depleted squad next season, you know, we need to keep this momentum going, don't we? Yeah, that, that's a. I think that's the worry. I think, I think the manager will probably have as well. Like the same, the same way you guys are probably looking at it. The managers probably thought about it, and my worry is is that if Bielik goes, he obviously he's gone to the World Cup, right? Mm-hmm. If he does well, I can only imagine in January he's gonna get called back. Yeah. He's going to get called back either to to get sold to another team because he's done well in the World Cup and his value of it, his value has got he's got he's gone up already because he's he's going to be involved in the World Cup. Um, Hannibal's gone to the World Cup, so these players in January, like they could just the parent club could just says, okay, we want to sell you in January, transfer windows open, we call you back, and and sell and sell you on, and if we haven't got the money to buy these players. You know, then we lose out. Who who else comes in? Mm. Who's going to replace these players? Um, you know, and that's that's my worry. I'm not even looking at the end of the season. I'm looking at January because if these guys goes and have and have an unbelievable tournament uh, competition at the World Cup and they're, they're playing it against the best countries that you the best players, world class players, and Hannibal and Bielik are you know they're doing their thing and they're playing really well. These kind of competition, actually, this is where this is. It's like a, it's like a shop. Do you know what I mean? Like they they're on they're on sale at the moment. They put they're putting themselves out there, and depending on you know if they do well or not, they can get called back and get sold. So, I'm looking at January already. Like I, I've seen it happen. I've seen players get moves from from World Cups, African Cup of Nations. You know they they like they'll just have a good month in that tournament, and you know the other teams want to buy them. And my worry is in January if we lose all these players, and obviously like you said, Longello, we got Trusty on loan, um, Sanderson on, so like so many players. Like John Ruddy just squad. John Ruddy just signed a new contract, which mm. sorry, which is great to see. Um, you know that I, I really wanted him to to sign an extension. Um. And then we have Troy Deeney's out of contract in 2023 as well um, in the summer. Harley Deeney's out of contract in the summer as well. Um, I think only Max 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 is fine um, at the minute. I, I don't know. Like I, There's just so many players in there that we could. I think it's like all together. If all the lone players and, all, and also the players that are out of contract all leave, I think it's all together. There may be about six or seven. That's that's pretty much almost our starting eleven. It's scary to oh. think, isn't it? Mm. No, it's yeah, scary really, to think. Yeah. So I just I just hope like the 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 people in the background and you know, um, they they're working towards it and they've got a contingency plan or they've got a they've got a plan to move forward with it. Hopefully, um, I haven't got that information, so I can't say if they are if they're not. Mm. Um, but. I, I would I would like to think so, the same as you guys. You'd like to think that they're actually working towards it. Um, so yeah, like, it, it would for me off the January. Then I think depending on where how the club um, acts, then we'll then we're gonna know where we're gonna finish mm-hmm. at the end of the season. I so I think if the good. club in if the club if 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 the club invests maybe on one one or two players more. Then you'll probably say, okay, we can actually push in for playoffs depending on, on the quality of players that comes in. And if we retained our loan players in January, and if they don't, we might struggle because you know everyone knows that football with injuries, we we do have a good squad and maybe two, three players that can come in and replace the ones are playing now. But I think we do need maybe an, an extra one or two players just in case, let's say Troy Deeney gets injured. Let's say, I don't know, Longello gets it and, and so on and so on. Do you know what I mean? And 
we don't want our main players to 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 be injured but in football anything can happen and we just need to have that that in place just in case anything happens yeah 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 well i completely agree with a lot of what you said there uh, mate it's been um really interesting to get your thoughts on a lot of the things here um we've got a couple uh two more questions actually uh jamie do you want to ask yours first yeah sure so going back to your career Jax, what was the your favorite blues goal that you scored Oh wow! Um, my favorite one. Twenty one to choose from, isn't there? Yeah, that, there's a, there's a few good ones. There's a there's a few good ones. Hundred uh, percent. I, I I do remember the the MK Dons at home, um, where I've I've got the ball from John Terrell, and I drove in the box. Um, Chopped, like I said, chopped, um, chopped the first defender, and then the second chop, which sent about five five people to the to the shops, um, and then with my left foot hitting the roof of the net, I think that was that was a really good goal. I was having like a, a patchy period where I wasn't really, I was playing, I was playing okay, but I wasn't, I wasn't really playing at my best, and yeah, and, and I remember that goal, and I remember putting the finger up like just to calm mm-hmm. everyone down. Um, so I remember that. I think also the uh, leads away. Um, that was early on in in my career um, where I came on in the second half and I got the like the ball went up to Clayton Donaldson. Defender not nodded it into my path on the left hand side and I drove um, left foot into into the bottom corner. I think that was that was special because it was early on in my Blues career. Um, and obviously um, Stoke at home, where I've, I've absolutely just belted it past Jack Butler, and I think it was in goal. Mm. Um, I think those three, I'll probably say, were uh, to be fair, even Bristol, Bristol at home, that was class. Sheffield, mm. Sheffield United um, at home, uh, when we needed to stay up, uh, we needed to stay up uh, in. I can't remember what season that was. We needed to stay. We needed to stay up. And we needed to win um, that game. I ended up scoring the second goal. Um, Rotherham away again, fighting for relegation. We need we needed to win. Yeah. Um, I ended up scoring to equalise, and then we end up winning the game. So there, there, there's so many good memories. I can't really pinpoint one because there's just so many good memories. Even games that I didn't score, like Fulham away when we beat them 5-2, like we absolutely battered them. Um, Derby away when Keith Bell scored um, on the volley. The ball came out edge of the box, ball me hit it. Um, yeah, so the, uh, David Davis, uh, Digger scoring against Aston Villa. Um, when, he, when he scored, he went mad, took his top off. Um, that was that was an unbelievable well. moment. Yeah. yeah, do you know what I mean? So I could never, I could never pinpoint one, but because they're just so many good memories, I, I don't, I don't really have one that really sticks out of my head and, and say that one. But I think I've I've given you quite a lot there. <laughs> yeah, so you can you can you can, probably, you can probably you can probably pick you can probably <laughs> pick one where you thought is is my favorite. You reminded me of a lot of goals that I've seen as well it's like wow that's amazing that is. it's like mm-hmm. proper nostalgic journey that was all those moments I mean that mm-hmm. Davis goal was like such a yeah. relief as well because it was the mm-hmm. first game back it was. And, and for him yeah. to finally score it's like oh thank god honestly man it was just literally we were 1-0 down that's Gary right. Gardner scored the header as yeah. well yeah yeah yeah. Yeah. Ironic. It's amazing. yeah yeah takes you back in it like thinking about like some of the goals that you you may have been at or he was that and you know like I said it's just brilliant going back and reflecting on that and, and actually being part of it like like I said that goal with Villa we're, we're losing and Digger scored and we just like every, like it, it was just like a standstill where you're just like oh my god like <laughs> is it is yeah. unbelievable like like just just great memories like I, I, I love that I've watched that. that personally I haven't been a Blues fan as long as Tommy and Jamie but that is my favourite goal and I love watching it back and the, the reaction from the uh, Tilton in that goal oh it's just uh, it, honestly it's an oh it's amazing it's amazing and that's why we love doing this because it's so nice to to speak about um past Blues moments and everything but yeah, yeah unbelievable moment in terms of there's one important game we have to talk about as well quickly the uh, 4-3 against QPR 
What 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 was that game like for you? <laughs> His reaction <laughs> told me everything that. <laughs> Listen, I've never been stressed that much like in the game before. Like, mm. like normally, like, I'm I'm a calm person. Like I'm like I'm just calm. Like I, mm. but the game it was so stressful. Like we went from absolutely battering them in the first half. Like they didn't they didn't know what was going on. Like we turned up. Shea scored. A first half hat trick. Like we, we just battered them. Second half, they came out and we were like, oh my day. Like what what is going on? And they scored. First one went in, we was like, Oh yeah, nah. The first one is like, Oh yeah, okay, cool. Come on, lads. Let's go. Come on. No more. Second one went in, I was like, Oh, for crying. Like, what is come on? Like, not another one. Then they scored. Like I just felt, I, I didn't know what was going on. I literally, I was just like, what is this? They mm. got the penalty. They got the penalty and that was it. And you could only put, you know, you could only trust the, your goalkeeper to, to, you know, to bail you guys out. And Campy, wow. What a moment that is like for him, especially as a goalkeeper. Like what a moment. Like probably it's a moment that he, he, he won't repeat again. Because things like that don't happen. You go you go from 4-0 to 4-3, last minute of the game, they could score to to make it 4-4. It would feel like a like we lost the game. Because mm. we, we had such a huge margin. And you know, he ends up saving it and we end up winning 4-3. It is like if like it's like if we actually got promoted. That's why it, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. Why it felt yeah. like <laughs> it felt like we actually got promoted. It's unbelievable. The scenes in the dressing room was ledge um mm. you know i think everyone was buzzing even the fans were buzzing whether or not like it's a roller coaster like up and down but it's it such a good game to watch if you're just a neutral fan do you know what i mean it's yeah. a good game to watch oh man it was i i, I went to that game as well so it was quite tr- it's quite a journey down on a, a, sun, a saturday afternoon and yeah. honestly when we're four nil up it was like this doesn't usually happen to us so i'm just going to enjoy it and then the second half comes around and I can't enjoy it <laughs> because it's just literally relentless because it was the first half we were relentless at them and then the second half they were relentless towards us. Yeah. So we felt like the opposites in pretty much the same half. So it's like, oh, this is absolute torture. It, literally, I couldn't I couldn't breathe properly almost towards no. those last few minutes. It was like, come on, if just get through these last few minutes. Mm. Just come on. <laughs> Oh, man. That's 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 how it was for us as well on the pitch. It was literally just trying to get through it because they threw everything towards us. I think um, uh, is it Matt, Matt Smith came on in the second half and they literally threw everything towards him. And he's such a handful. Yeah. Um, he caused us so much problems. I think he scored the first goal that um, it came from a corner and he and he headed it in, and it was just like. Like he came on and he changed the game for them because he he gave them a, a different dynamic. Um, the first half they were trying to play like nice football and whatnot, and we were just like, "No, you're not doing that." Like two banks of four, like which just like blocked up, hit them on a counter attack, and we scored some really good goals. Second half they just said, "Sod it, lump it into to to Smith up top." And that caused us all sorts of problems. Like they were just going for it, going for it, and that, and they got the momentum at home as well, playing at home. Um, yeah, it, it was a roller coaster. But like we were, I think we, I think we had a couple of beers on the way back as well. I like just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the gaffer let us have a couple of beers on the way back. Yeah, that that was yeah, that was really good, man. But you need them after that, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Uh, I think I snuck an extra one just to <laughs> just to make, just to put to calm me down. Oh man, that's a proper amazing memories in there. Really does, yeah. It's like um, yeah, it's like proper nostalgic stuff that is. Yeah, going down all those memories and <laughs> realizing that we've not had some easy games over these last few years. And really, like, no. I mean, like we've had some terrible finishes in the um league as such because obviously we haven't finished above seventeenth for years. Um, yeah. But it, in terms of like what's gone on in those times, then it's just been absolutely chaotic. Like there's not been a single day at the Blues for a long, long time where it's been normal. It feels like mm. at least the one week we were playing uh, QPR and um, 
it's four three, and the next two are like about to go into financial fair play or whatever it is. Mm. It is it's, it's a shame, really, because like uh, like I've said to you guys, like over the years we've had some really good teams, like, we've had some really good players as mm. well. Um, but it's just been a shame behind the scenes that it's not worked out really well, and um, through through my time at Birmingham, although like I've I've had nothing but good experiences and um most of the time I would say it is just a shame that a lot of the times we were just fighting relegation like mm -hmm. every other season we were always fighting to stay up um we were fighting to stay in the league and you know like it is it, it's just a shame because like, like I said we we had very good players we had good some good managers a lot mm -hmm. in there as well um but we just we just didn't have I'll probably say their backing from, you know, people behind mm -hmm. the scenes or there's all this turmoil or he wasn't stable. Um he wasn't run properly, I'd say, sometimes. And yeah, I think the managers that came in, like I said, Gary Rowe, Gary Monk, who came in, they really tried their best um to do that. And at times you could probably see that on the pitch. And then other times it was out of their hands and out of our hands as well, because the consistency wasn't there. Mm. You know, we would win, we'd win maybe two, three games and then we'll lose like three games. And like, so mm. the consistency just wasn't there, like in terms of in our performances. Mm. And I think that would, like I said, it reflects on what happens behind the scenes so much. Um, as you can see at other big clubs in the Premier League, like, if the behind the scenes is mm. is not taken care of, you know, it reflects on on the players and on the pitch as well. Um, whether fans want to accept that, they don't need to accept it. But I, I I've been in change rooms and I've been and I've been there and I know exactly that the meetings, the the talks, people. Do you know what I mean? Like it's just not mm. it's toxic. Mm. Do you know what I mean? It's not a good environment. Um, a lot of bickering, a lot of moaning. And it happens, like I said, it happens not mm. only at, you know, championship level, league, two, league, whatever league it is, um, the, at, at the highest level it happens. So I think now the good thing about Birmingham now for me just looks like everything is in place. And, you know, the city looks like the city's buzzing with what's going on with Birmingham. Um, the fans, The fans like sound really happy to me. They sound really positive. They're buzzing with the manager. Yeah. Uh, they're buzzing with the players that we have, the caliber of players that we have. You know, it's it's exciting, and you know, I can only I can I'm I'm just happy that like especially me having you know still people that I played with like like I said Harley, Max, um, Juki, um, Scott Hogan, people that are still there playing. Like it, it makes me happy. Like for them in in for them to actually get the success that I think that, you know, if everything was in place before it would have been now we would we would probably be talking about oh like are we getting promoted? Do you know what I mean? I think if those things were in place, I think like now that those five years, I think if we work towards it, it would have been like, okay, are we getting are we getting promoted this mm -hmm. season? We wouldn't be talking about like oh uh, like what's so I think now like I said it's just a it's a progress. If we if we do this right, and maybe this season, the following season, I can't mm -hmm. see why you know in the in the next two three years that we're talking about Birmingham in the Premier League and and you know and and for or at least fighting to be in the Premier League mm -hmm. um, for playoffs and and that. So like I say, it's a work in progress, and I could only wish wish the, the management and everyone working there, you know, all the best and and hopefully you know we can get can get that promotion. Like the that's what the fans want, isn't it? Oh god, yeah. Yes. Well yeah. Fingers crossed though. Eh? Let's um hope that all comes true. Cause yeah. oh, it's been too long now. It's been oh. twelve years yeah. in the Premier League. Oh, mm. Needs to change that. Needs to change that. Needs to come mm. needs to get back in the Premier yeah. League. Um, Tough twelve years, mate. Oh honestly mm. too long. But um, yeah, mate. Thank you so much for coming on this evening. It's been real. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you and get to the, uh, get to listen to some of the thoughts you've been um, sharing with us. Um, and yeah, pretty much. I think that's pretty much all we've got to talk to. Really, it's about uh, an hour podcast that is now. Um, 
but yeah once again thank you so much jack for coming on it's been a real pleasure to talk to you to listen to what you've had to say um thank you jack uh oh, done it oh he's done it again he's done it again he's, done it again. <laughs> he's, always, he's always calling us jack and zamy mags Ooh. and it should be uh zach and jamie but there you go I'm tommy appalling, <laughs> <laughs> oh man i'll get it right Put on a pooper <laughs> yeah <laughs> i have a big bleep at the end of that so i need to yeah <laughs> oh man anyway thank you zach and jamie i nearly did it twice that would have been embarrassing wouldn't it um for joining me as well thank no you problem. guys for listening and uh keep right on hey,